Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. <coughs> sir, before we turn to <coughs> Mr. Daly's evidence, may I please deal with the witness statement of Mr. Kenneth Donnelly, who is the current Deputy Crown Agent for Specialist Casework at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. For the transcript, his statement can be found at WITN 105-10100. There is no need to bring that up on screen, but I can confirm, sir, that this witness statement has been disclosed to call participants. Mr Donnelly's evidence is relevant, sir, both to phases five, four and five of the inquiry. For the purposes of phase four, can I please indicate that paragraphs 1 to 43 are to be treated as read into the inquiry's record? Although I do not intend to read the content of those paragraphs now. As a result, this evidence may be taken into account by you in due course, even though it has not been the subject of oral evidence during phase four. For the remaining paragraphs in Mr Donnelly's witness statement, namely paragraphs 44 to 74, these will either be the subject of oral evidence or read into the record in phase five. Um, I should also confirm that this witness statement will be published in its entirety on the inquiry's website after today's hearing. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> May we please call Mr. Daly? Yep. <laughs> I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Could you confirm your full name, please, Mr. Robert Daly? D sorry, Robert Daly. Thank you for coming to the inquiry to ins assist it in its work. As you know, I will be asking you questions on behalf of the inquiry. You should have hard copies of two witness statements in your name in a bundle in front of you. The first is at tab A1 and is dated the 7th of November, 2023. If you could turn to page 39 of that, please. I have that. Do you have a copy with a visible signature? Yes, I do. Is that your signature? It is. The second statement is at tab A2 and is dated the 27th of December, 2023. Do you have uh, do you have a, an A2 in your bundle? No, I don't. So my apologies. We're just um, obtaining a hard copy of the second statement uh, for insertion in the witnesses bundle. Yes, of course. <clears throat>
Sarah, I understand the document is being printed. Um, I, I don't know if you, you would rather that we break for five minutes or whether you're content to, to remain on screen. No, let, let's just get it done and um, I'm happy to sit you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Daly, do you now have a copy of a statement in your name dated the 27th of December 2023? I do. Could you turn, please, to page 12 of that statement? Yes. Is there a visible signature on that copy? Yes, there is. Is that your signature? It is. I understand that there are some corrections which you wish to make to your <coughs> written evidence in light of documents which have recently been provided to you by the inquiry. Is That's that correct? correct? Yes. Yes. Would you like to make those corrections? Yes. Uh, in my first statement, sorry, in my second statement, I stated at paragraph 25 of my first statement, I believe that from 2006, all reports uh, for non-police authorities were required to be submitted to the Crown Office and Procurator of Fiscal Service electronically. I asked for that to be amended. To, well, I, I actually say secondly, I believe the date I gave was likely incorrect. I now think it was from 2009 or 2010 and not 2006. From a document I received last week, it states that from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service uh, that all specialist reporting agencies should, from 1st of January 2006, be reporting all cases electronically to the Procurator Fiscal. So it was to change that back again. Uh, and paragraph 23 of the second request asked me what role I play played in preparing the prosecution. This is for William Quorn. I stated the wording of the charge is similar to the wording used when you submit a charge via the SRA website, but I cannot recall with certainty if this is something I did. I can now say that the report would have been submitted via the SRA website. However, I cannot recall if it was myself that submitted it or Raymond Grant, who was my ex-colleague. And also in my first statement at paragraph 11, I recall that it was temporarily promoted to the role of investigation manager in 2000, and I recall I attended some training at that time. <clears throat> Having looked at my statement again, paragraph 69 to 71, described parts of my training in 2005, I would also have been trained on these parts in 2000. Thank you, Mr Daly. With those corrections made, are the contents of your statements true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, they are. For the purposes of the transcript, the references for Mr. Daly's statements are WITN 089-40100 and WITN 089-40200. Mr. Daly, I will not be asking you about every aspect of the witness statements you have provided, which will be published on the inquiry's website in due course. I will instead be asking about certain specific issues which are addressed in them. Yes. Starting, please, with the roles you have held with the Post Office. You have been employed by the Post Office since 1979, is that right? That's correct. You started as a counter clerk? Yes. You have set out in your statement the various roles you held thereafter and up until 1997. And those roles included roles in the remittance unit, cash management and distribution, is that right? That's correct. In 1997, you joined the security team with the post office? That's correct. And you started in the security team in 1997 in a postal officer grade, is That's that correct. right? Yes. So you were not at that point involved in criminal investigations, is no. that right? Then there was a period in around 2000 when you were temporarily promoted to the role of investigation manager. Yes. Roughly how long were you in that temporary role? Can you recall? I can't fully recall. Uh, it could have been any time between six, probably about six months, maybe more, maybe less. I, I can't recall. And during that time, were you involved in conducting investigations? Only as a second officer. At that stage, your temporary role did not become a permanent one, is that right? That's correct. Is it right that you applied for a further temporary investigation manager role in 2004? 
Yes. And you were successful in obtaining that position? Yes. And on this occasion, after the six-month temporary period came to an end, you were told your position was being made permanent, is that That's right? That's correct. And this was in around 2005? Yes. You say in your statement at paragraph four that in 2011, your role changed to security and investigation manager. That's correct. And your current role is that of security manager? Yes. Were these roles the same in substance, albeit different in title? In substance, in the 2011, I believe it was, we took on the role of the physical security as well. And that was visiting branches after robberies or burglaries or to give security advice. I would like to turn, please, to the structure of the security team over the time you have worked within it. You say in your statement at paragraph 33 that when you joined the security team, there was a head of security and investigations. Yes. At, and that head of security and investigations oversaw the investigation team. Yes. The security team. Yes. The physical security team. Yes. And the casework team. I, I, believe, I believe so. At this stage, the investigation team dealt solely with criminal investigations and had its own head of investigations, is That's that correct. right? And you recall there being a restru restructure in 2008? Yes. When a senior security manager position was introduced? <clears throat> yes. Is it right that you recall the senior security manager reporting to the head of security? Yes and overseeing a number of teams within the security team? Yes. Was it at this point that the fraud team was created in 2008? The fraud team was always there. It was just what we were called the investigation managers or investigation team, I believe. Then we called it the fraud team. It just, it was a change. It was a change in name. Change in, yes. And you recall the fraud team being responsible for undertaking investigations? Yes. Is it also right that when the restructure happened in 2008, you were required to submit your CV? Yes. Was that, in essence, you reapplying for your own job as an investigator? Yes. You have highlighted in your second statement that the CV you submitted in 2008 erroneously contained your wife's educational achievements. Is that right? Yes. Did you realise this and correct this at the time? No. So it's something that's only come to light in the course of preparing your second statement? Yes. At paragraph 35 of your statement, you say that in 2011, investigation managers also took on a physical security role as well as their investigation role. Yes. That's what you were referring to earlier when yes. there was the title change. Yes. You recall there being further restructures in 2004 to 2005 and in 2009. Yes. Sorry, 2019. Yes. Do you recall the various restructuring exercises also involving headcount reductions? I don't, I don't recall. I'm sorry, could you say that sorry. again with your voice up a little? I don't recall. Do you recall any of the restructuring exercises impacting on the workload of investigators? In 2019? Uh, uh, it, there were a number you dealt with, 2008, 2011, 2014 to 15, and 2019. In relation to any of those, do you recall that impacting upon the workload of investigators? The investigations have stopped by 2019. That was the only time. 2014 and the other dates, no, there was no impact. In terms of the geographical structure of the security team and where you sat within it, you say at paragraph 10 of your first statement that you have been based in Glasgow throughout the time you have held roles in the security team. Is that right? That's correct. 
does that include the period from 1997 until you took up a permanent investigator role in 2005? That's correct. When you held a temporary investigator role in 2000, were you at that stage investigating matters both in England and in Scotland? No, just Scotland. And so do I take it, um, just so that I'm clear from the start, Mr Daly, that the structure of the security team which you've described relates to the structure over the whole of the United Kingdom? It wasn't confined to Scotland, your description, was it? That's correct. Thank you. Yeah. Is it right that since 2005 you have been part of the Security Operations North team? Yes. You have addressed in your statements, and I will be asking you in due course, about your involvement in the criminal investigation and prosecution of two individuals, Peter Holmes and William Quam. Mr Holmes's post office branch was based in Newcastle, and Mr Quam's post office branch was based in the Outer Hebrides in Scotland. Both of these investigations commenced in 2008. Since 2005, have you been conducting investigations into matters both in England and in Scotland? Yes. And in terms of the geographical remit of the Security Operations North team, um, does that cover the north of England as well as Scotland? It does, yes. Can you help with a little bit more detail <clears throat> on which parts of the north of England came within your remit or come within your remit? I believe it was Cumbria and over to Newcastle. Uh, and upwards. I'd like to turn, please, to the decision-making process for criminal investigation and prosecution of sub-postmasters, their assistants and managers, and post office employed branch staff in England and Wales on the one hand and Scotland on the other. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 136 of Mr Daly's first witness statement? That is page 36 of WITN 0894010. And at paragraph 136, you say this. The conduct of investigations in Scotland was similar to England and Wales. The key difference was in the prosecution of cases. As I have described elsewhere in this statement, the prosecuting authority in Scotland is the COPFS. That's the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. Is that right? That's correct. All cases, whether they be police or non-police cases, have to be submitted to the COPFS who then decide whether to proceed to prosecution or not. In around 2006, it became a requirement that non-police authorities had to report cases through the COPFS Specialist Reporting Agency website. On inputting a case, you had to input a charge to proceed to submission. So that's the date that you addressed in correcting your, state, your second statement at the outset. That's correct, yeah. So you believe that that date is in fact correct? Yes. In relation to how cases were submitted to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, before the change in 2006, how did that happen? It was a manual report. You had to do a, a, a type report uh, that was similar to the offender report that was then delivered to the Procurator Fiscal uh, either by post or by hand. You deal with the process followed by post office investigators for criminal investigations at paragraph 59 of your first statement. Could we have that on screen, please? It's page 17. <coughs> Uh, 
And at paragraph 59, you say that you have considered three versions of the conduct of criminal investigations policy from 2013, 2014, and 2018. You refer to a flowchart from the first two of those versions, and you use that to explain the process work, how the process worked in England and Wales and in Scotland. Yes. Could we have on screen, alongside Mr Daly's statement, if that's possible at all, at POL 0003100 We can see that this is the August 2013 version of the Post Office Conduct of Criminal Investigations Policy. Going to the bottom of page two, please. We see the start of the, scrolling down a little more, please. We see the start of the flow chart you refer to in your statement. It provides on the left-hand side, a number of sources of a case being raised including an audit shortage, the Grapevine team. Can you help with which team that was? The Grapevine team, uh, they were our alarm receiving centre but to start with and dealt with any, any suspicious incidents at post offices. Post, post offices were encouraged to phone them up so we could send out a text blast. In regards to information, in regards, in regards to inquiries, I can't recall what they would have provided to us. Also listed as a source are contract managers and client, e.g. DVLA, DWP. Going over the page, please, to page three of this document. Looking down the stage, we can see a number of steps on the flowchart for process. Case assigned to security manager. Is there evidence to proceed? If the answer is no, then no further action case to be closed. If yes, interview and com compile evidence. The next step is case preparation. Phase one MG format. Then the next stage is team leader to review the case file, proceed with the case, question mark. If it's no, then it's case closure. Further action could be further inquiries to be made, file returned to team leader. If it is yes, then it goes to the criminal law team to review the case file. Proceed with case, question mark. No, then it's no further action. Further action required. There could be further inquiries made, file returned to the criminal law team and team leader informed. If yes, then it goes on to Cartwright King to produce the charges. Is it your evidence that the process in place up to the point of the criminal law team, so stopping short of going to Cartwright King, that that was essentially the same for Scotland as it was for England and Wales until the introduction of a firm of Scottish solicitors into the process for Scotland in 2013. Yes. In a Scottish case, before this change, so before the introduction of a, a Scottish firm of solicitors, you say that a decision was returned to you by the criminal law team. So this is in paragraph 59 of your statement we see alongside. If the decision was to proceed with prosecution, you would f submit the file to the Crown Office and procurate a fiscal service, is that right? That's correct. If the decision was, proceed that was not to proceed, then the case would be closed. That's correct. This document shows the process in place in 2013, 
up to the point of the flow chart where there is consideration of a case by the criminal law team and not beyond that, was the process any different from 2005 to 2013? With the exception of Cartwright King uh, being in involved later on, I don't know when Cartwright King became involved, but essentially, Stopping yes. short of Cartwright King and stopping at the stage of it being referred to the criminal law team yes. and a decision being made by them as to proceeding. Was this the process we've looked at in this flowchart the same between 2005 and 2013, or did it differ in any material way? From what I recall, it was the same. Before we turn to the introduction of Scottish solicitors into the process for Scottish cases in 2013 and the reasons for that, I'd like to deal, please, with the training you had for your role as a post office investigator. Yeah. That document can come down. Thank you. In terms of your experience when you first took up a temporary investigation role in 2000, did you have any experience of criminal investigation or criminal law, whether in England and Wales or Scotland, at that point? No. <coughs> Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 11 of Mr Daly's first statement? That is page 5. At paragraph 11, you recall attending <coughs> some training when you were temporarily promoted in 2000. Given the correction you made at the outset of your evidence, should we understand that the following paragraph, which deals with training you received on taking up the role of investigation manager in 2005, the training detailed there, was also received in 2000, or was it some lesser version of that training? It was a lesser version of the training. Uh, there was parts I can't recall in 2000, the regulation of investigative powers, the II mark, or the NPA notifications. The, the NPA, the non-police agency, we only dealt with Scottish cases in 2000, so the team did. Looking then to the training you received in 2005 at paragraph 12 here, you say, I recall that when taking up the role of investigation manager, I received four to five weeks training in the training unit above the Lavender Hill Post Office Battersea Delivery Office in London. The training was given by Royal Mail Group accredited trainers who had experience of investigations. The training covered the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, Codes of Practice, Theft Act, carrying out searches, suspect offender interviews, cognitive witness interviews, taking witness statements, including the use of the solicitor and friends forms, the Regulatory Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, um, IMARC, which you explain in brackets here, refers to information, intention, method, administration, risk assessment, communications, human rights, and other legal issues, and NPA notifications, NPA referring to a non-police agency, and the notifications refer to notifications we made to the police about the criminal proceedings we undertook. It appears from the list of topics here that this training focused on investigation in England and Wales. Is that right? Yes. Before we turn to the training you received on investigations in Scotland, I'd like to deal, please, with some of the detail of your initial training on lines of inquiry and disclosure obligations in England and Wales. Could we have on screen, please, page 20 of this statement, paragraph 72?
and at paragraph 72 you say this, regarding the investigator's duties in carrying out investigations, I recall during the initial training that we were taught to ensure all evidence is obtained, lines of inquiries are completed, mitigating circumstances are considered and investigated, and interviews are conducted within guidelines. All activities taken were to be recorded on the event log. Were you aware from your initial investigator training that there was an obligation on a criminal investigator to pursue lines of inquiry which pointed away from the guilt of the suspect? Yes. You go on at paragraph 73 to say this. Regarding obtaining evidence in the course of an investigation, also during initial training, we were taught that the investigator must obtain all original documents. For example, in the event of an audit shortage, audit cash sheets, horizon reports printed at the time of the audit, branch trading statements and horizon reports produced by the branch. The documents to which you refer here, are they the ones you would obtain as an investigator at a branch where an audit of the branch had discovered an apparent shortfall? Yes. You go on at paragraph 74 to deal with obtaining evidence from third parties. And you say this, the initial training also taught us about obtaining evidence from third parties who might hold relevant evidence. For example, bank statements, if it was suspected a shortfall was due to the monies being deposited into a suspect's bank account using Horizon. Also, ARQ requests to Fujitsu in order to obtain Horizon data in various cases. For example, to investigate deposits into bank accounts in post office card account cases involving a vulnerable person duped into making multiple withdrawals. When you were an investigator, were you aware that the obligation to pursue lines of inquiry pointing away from as well as towards the guilt of a suspect extended to material in the hands of a third party, for example, Fujitsu? Yes. At paragraph 75, you deal with training on disclosure obligations, and you say this. Regarding an investigator's disclosure obligations, the initial training taught us that in England, it is the duty of the investigator, I think that should be to provide a record of all information obtained and to disclose all relevant information to the prosecution and defense. Pausing there, you repeat the second part of the, this explanation of an investigator's disclosure obligations, that is to disclose all relevant material to the prosecution and defense at paragraph 117 of your first statement in the context of disclosure obligations on you in the prosecution of Peter Holmes. You have, however, made a correction to this in your second statement at paragraph 2.8. Is it right that you now recall that the disclosure obligation on a post office investigator in England and Wales was to provide all appropriate material, used and unused, to the criminal law team who would deal with onwards disclosure to the defence? That's correct. You have dealt with the need to complete schedules of used and unused material as an investigator in England and <coughs> Wales at paragraph 29 of your first statement. Did you understand from your initial training that when you were an investigator completing disclosure documentation in England and Wales, you were acting as the disclosure officer in the case? Yes. <coughs> Did you understand from your initial training that this was a distinct role over and above your role as an investigator, which imposed on you additional and distinct duties, such as, for example, the obligation to draw material to the attention of the prosecutor, where there was any doubt as to whether that might undermine the prosecution case or might reasonably be expected to assist the defence disclosed by the accused. I would have. I'm sorry, can you repeat I, that? I would have. Could we have on screen, please, 
document reference POL 0012160. The top email on this page is an email from Andrew Daly to you, among other investigators, dated the 6th of September 2010. It forwards on an email chain with the subject line committal papers, asking whether there is any interest in a presentation from a Royal Mail investigation procedures and standards manager called Mick Matthews in relation to procedures and standards applying to committal papers. So if we can scroll down a little, Mick Matthews' email at the bottom of the page, also dated the 6th of September 2010, was originally sent to Ian Murphy and Andy Hayward. And he says, Ian, Andy, I have developed procedures and standards in respect of committal papers, and this has been agreed by the criminal law team. Accordingly, the P&S and the relevant forms are associated with this email. Arrangements are in hand to publish the documents on SharePoint and the GSD. A presentation has been delivered to RML, is that Royal Mail Letters? Yes. And PFWW, Parcel Force Worldwide? Yes. Investigators, as they do not get the same number of committals as investigators in Post Office Limited. So you may wish to merely forward this to your investigators for their information in respect of the procedures and amended forms. You address this email and the documents which were attached to it at paragraph 78 of your first statement. Um, we needn't pull it up on screen um, unless you'd like to go to it, Mr. Daly, but you say that you cannot recall exactly when you received the materials attached to Mick Matthews' original email, but your belief is that um, this would have been the first occasion on which you saw those materials. The materials within his zip file, yes. The materials to which you were referred for the purposes of making your statement, the attachments to the email, included a new procedures and standards document relating to committal papers dated July 2010, an updated version of a procedures and standards document dealing with disclosure of unused material and the Criminal, Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act 1996, and that was dated the 1st of July 2010. And it also attached a copy of the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act 1996 Code of Practice. Just to clarify, is it your evidence at paragraph 78 of your statement that you had not received any of these documents including a copy of the CPIA Code of Practice before this point in September 2010. Sorry, can I see uh, paragraph 78 again? If we, can, uh, if we can pull up the paragraph on screen, it's paragraph 78 <laughs> of the first statement, and that is page 21. Scrolling down a little, please. At paragraph 77, you refer to the document we've just looked yep. at, the email from Andrew Daly dated <coughs> the 6th of September 2010, together with, with its attachments. And there are four attachments there. And um, three of those are ones that I've just referred to. One of them is the um, CPIA Code of Practice and we can go to that uh, document if it would help to see it. Would that assist, or do you know the document I'm referring yes. to? Yes. Okay. If we can just take the attachments in turn, actually, the first is POL 
And that is the procedures and standards document which Mick Matthews refers to creating the committal and summary trial papers and processes, July 2010. The next attachment was POL 0010484848. This is the yeah. Appendix 1 to PNS 9.5, Disclosure of Unused Material and the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act, 1996. And that version is dated the 1st of July 2010. The next attachment is POL 0006405950. And that is the CPIA yep. Code of Practice. Um, if you need to, we can look at the next page. Scrolling down a little, please. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, can I go back to paragraph 78 again, please? Yes, of course. Can I see so the whole? Paragraph 78 of the statement. Page 21, please. So looking first at 77, hmm. you've looked at the yeah. email and those attachments that we've just looked at, the first three. Yeah. And you say, that? you're asked where I was based when I received this email, whether this was the first time I'd been sent these materials and if any presentation about them was given. And then you say at 78, the documents relate to some procedures and standards that have been developed in relation to committal papers. At the time I received the email at document, yeah. in the Stockton reference, I was based in Scotland. I can't recall exactly when I received the materials, but it is my belief that this would have been the first occasion on which I saw them. And we'll come on to the presentation and your recollection on that. But my question is in relation to the attachment that is the code of practice and whether that is in the same category as the procedure and standards documents in that you received it for the first time at this stage or whether you had received that document any sooner. I can't recall receiving it before then. Okay. You also say at paragraph 78 that you cannot recall receiving the presentation referred to in the email. Do you mean by that the presentation that Mick Matthews was offering? Yes. Do you recall any discussion as to whether that kind of presentation might be useful for investigators <coughs> in the post recall. office? Sorry, I don't recall any discussion around it. Okay. When you took up the permanent investigator role in 2005, were you given any training on the Horizon system? I don't recall any uh, training on the Horizon system. Uh, I do recall, I think, when I was temporary in 2000, we went to a hotel for a day to look at the system. What that called, I can't remember. And you say to look at the system. What, yeah, what we, do you we, mean by we that? Were, we were put in front of terminals, and it was in a hotel. I think it was a Swallow Hotel in Glasgow, as it was known at that time. Uh, I'm not sure what it called, to be honest with you. Did you receive any other training on the Horizon system apart from that training in the hotel in 2000? I don't recall receiving any other training. Did you ever receive any training um, on analysis of the data from the Horizon system? No. You say in your statement at paragraph 31 that during an investigation, you liaised mainly with contract managers, the former agent debt team, and cash management. Is that right? Yes. 
Were you given any guidance in your training on which other teams within the post office you should speak to to gather evidence in a case where the Horizon system had shown an apparent shortfall? <coughs> Not that I recall. Were you made aware that product and branch accounting or information security might have relevant information relating to the operation of the Horizon <coughs> system? Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? So there are two specific teams that I'm asking about, product and branch accounting and, in, and information security. And I'm asking if you were ever made aware that they might have relevant information when you were looking at the Horizon system and shortfalls shown by it. Now that you've mentioned it, I probably would have been at the time. I was right when I wrote the statement. It's what I could recall at that point in time when I was writing it. Turning then, please, to training you received on investigations and prosecutions <laughs> in Scotland. Could we have page six of the statement on screen at the moment, please? <coughs> And if we can actually go back to the bottom of the previous page. <coughs> after dealing with the four to five weeks training you received, you say after a few months in my role as an... Going over the page, please. Investigations manager... I went to rugby to attend further training, including courtroom training. And in the next paragraph after this, you say at paragraph 13, I can also recall being given on-site slash field training on Scots law, with the main difference at the time being that in Scotland, a suspect was not offered a solicitor to be present at an interview. When did you receive this on-site or field training on Scots law? When I joined the team after my training. So in 2005? Yes. What I, format did that training take? It was going, sitting with fellow investigators and going out to do investigations, uh, primarily as a second officer. When I say Scots law, I probably should correct that and say the Scottish way of dealing with cases in Scotland. So was this, in essence, on-the-job training? Yes, it was. And who provided it? Uh, my colleagues within the investigation team in the north. Can you recall who that was now? It would have been... Raymond Grant, uh, Shirley Stockdale, they'd have been mentoring me. And how long did this on-the-job training last? Sorry, I'm trying to recall it. Uh, I honestly can't recall how long it lasted. I, I went out and done a few probably second officer interviews and then been thrown in the deep end, been mentored doing uh, first officer and conducting interviews. The main takeaway point for you appears to have been that at the time in <coughs> Scotland, a suspect was not offered a solicitor to be present in interview. And that's something which you address elsewhere in your statement. And you say changed in 2010, following the decision in CADA and Her Majesty's Advocate. Is that right? That's correct. Setting aside procedural safeguards for interview, did your on-the-job training cover the offences under Scottish law which might be relevant 
where the horizon system showed an apparent shortfall in a branch. I don't recall that being the case. It may follow. Does that mean it didn't cover the elements of any such offences which the prosecution would be required to prove? That's correct. <clears throat> Turning then, please, to the tra to training on disclosure obligations which were applicable in Scotland. Could we have on screen, please, page 21 of the statement we have on screen? At the top of the page here, which is a continuation of paragraph 75 from the previous page, you say this. I learned on taking up my role in Scotland that it is the duty of the investigator to do the same as in England, with the exception information is provided to the COPFS. The COPFS considers whether the information meets the disclosure test before disclosing the information. I attended some training on disclosure provided by, and there seems to be a gap there. Do, did you mean to say by uh, an organisation? We'll come to the document in, the, in a moment, so that may help you. Uh, and have located. Yeah, the disclosure would have been the present in relation to the presentation from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Could we have on screen, uh, and you say I have lo located a copy of the presentation that was given, which I exhibit to my statement. That's correct. Could we have on screen, please, the presentation to which you are referring, that reference, POL 00129134, please. The inquiry understands this document to date to May 2009. Um, can you help with whether that is correct? I, honest, I think you mentioned the date further on, but I can't recall what date it was. It appears to be a PowerPoint presentation produced by Kirsty McGowan from the Policy Division Crown Office. Was this training the first training you underwent which dealt specifically with disclosure <coughs> obligations in Scotland? Yes, I believe so. And in terms of dates, can you recall how long after you took up your permanent role in 2005 you went on this training? As I say, in fairness to you, the, the inquiry understands that this dates to May 2009. <coughs> if I put that into context, if this is the presentation I received in 2009, I would have been aware of disclosures to the Procurator Fiscal before that with my on-the-job training. So you, you, you were given some on-the-job training, you say, in relation to disclosure obligations by your colleagues in the team who were mentoring you before this. Is that, is that what you're saying? In a roundabout way, it, we wouldn't sit down and say this is disclosure training. It's as the job went on and you had to just, when you were producing your productions, as we call it in Scotland, it's exhibits in England, that you are just, you're providing them to the Procurator Fiscal. And I don't think anybody really mentioned disclosure that I can recall. It was just something I learned to do. Uh, and then, it was covered by disclosure. I know it was disclosure, but we didn't sit down and say, let's do disclosure to training to the Procurator Fiscal. Going to page five of this document, please. This sets out what the SRA, so Specialist Reporting Agency, and the Post Office was a specialist reporting agency at the times you were involved in. Is that right? That yes, sorry, that's correct. Record all relevant information obtained, provide the Crown with all relevant information, 
pursue all reasonable lines of inquiry. And on page nine, please, the consequences of non-disclosure are set out. Unnecessary trials, unnecessary delays, and in big, bold capital letters, miscarriages of justice. Do you recall this training now? I recall the attending. Uh, <coughs> it was Tully Allen, which was a police college. Uh, if you'd asked me to recollect the document without digging it out in the computer, I wouldn't have rec recollected it, but reading it, yes, I recall the training. You also refer in your first statement at paragraph 80 to a specialist reporting agency's disclosure course run by the Scottish Police College, which you attended on the 20th of October 2010. Just to clarify, <laughs> is that the same training as the training that is the subject of these slides, or was that a separate training event? No, sorry. I When you say this was produced in 2009, I thought that was a training you were uh, talking about in 2010. Well, my question it's, to you, you I refer to, to two different things in your statement. One, the training you say you went on and you've discovered the, the document here yep. uh, in relation to, and in, dis, in a separate paragraph, and perhaps we can go to it, it's paragraph 80 of the statement. That's page 22, please. And at paragraph, scrolling up a little, please. <coughs> paragraph 79. You refer to an email from the 5th of October 2010 and an attachment which was joining instructions, which we'll come on to. And you, you, explain, uh, you, you detail the circumstances where you were due to attend the Specialist Reporting Agency's disclosure course. Yeah. And you say at the following paragraph, I believe I was asked to attend the training as I was the investigation manager covering Scotland being based in Scotland at that time. I recall that I did attend on the 20th of October 2010. So trying to clarify whether you attended one lot of training on disclosure or two, the PowerPoint presentation we've just looked at with the big bold miscarriages of justice, was that a separate training event to this one being discussed here or the same one? The same one. Okay. <coughs> Could we have on screen, please, the materials which were provided by email ahead of the course you attended on the 20th of October 2010? <laughs> um, apologies, you need a reference for that. POL 001 29145. And so we have uh, the date here, the 20th of October 2010, <coughs> Specialist Reporting Agencies Disclosure Module Joining Instructions. And so just to be clear, the PowerPoint presentation we were looking at before, do you think that is one that was shown on this course on the 20th of October 2010? Yes. And so that was the first time on the 20th of October 2010 that you received formal training on disclosure obligations in Scotland. Yes. Right? Okay. There is um, a page providing background to the course on page nine of this document, please. <laughs> so. And this refers to Lord Coolsfield's report on disclosure dated the 12th of September, 2007. 
And it says, the four, four paragraphs down, Lord Caulsfield's report was published on the 12th of September 2007. The report forms the basis for the current Criminal Justice and Licensing Bill 2008, which will create legislation dealing with disclosure, which will be enacted in late 2010. And then over the page, please. <coughs> Scrolling down a little so we can see the whole page. <clears throat> this deals with the common law duty of disclosure. And it says at the top, it must be stressed that disclosure or the principles of disclosure are not a new concept. The principles currently exist in common law and have been emphasized in various stated cases and court decisions. And then the case of Smith and HMA is referred to. And the quote has in bold this, it is their duty to put before the procurator fiscal everything which may be relevant and material to the issue of whether the suspected party is innocent or guilty. We repeat, it is not for the police to decide what is relevant and material, but to give all the information which may be relevant and material. And then it says this, the above decision quite clearly and concisely outlines the duties of the police in criminal investigations However, since that judgment, a number of specialist reporting agencies now conduct their own investigations and report directly to the Crown and the common law duty placed upon the police apply, equally apply to SRAs. Do you recall reading that uh, joining instructions material ahead of the course? Not at the time, but I have recently pulled it back out and read that. Would you have read it ahead of the course? I would have. In advance of the training session in October 2010, were you ever provided by the post office or by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service with the Crown Office Guide for Specialist Reporting Agencies dated 2006? I think a copy of this has been quite recently provided to you by the inquiry. Do you know the document I'm referring to? I don't. If you could remind me of it, please. Uh, the reference is WITN. This is the document to which I was referring. Uh, Crown Office publication reports to the Procurator Fiscal a guide for specialist reporting agencies. <laughs> Seventh I would, edition. I would have received that, yes. Can you recall who you would have received that from? Was it the Post Office or the Crown Office? I think it was the Crown Office. Uh, I wonder if that might be a convenient moment for our morning break, please. Yes, of course. So what time shall we start? I'm... Uh, uh, 25 to, sir. 25 to. I mistakenly um, took myself off screen instead of unmuting myself. But we've got there, Mr. Price. Thank you, sir. Right, 25 to. Hello, sir. Hello. Can you see and hear us? I think so. Mr. Daly, uh, in terms of differences in the procedure governing investigations in England and Wales on the one hand and Scotland on the other, you identify a number of these in your statements. In addition to the difference relating to the presence of a solicitor in interview, which we've already touched on, you raise the following in your witness statements. 
first, uh, you deal with it, paragraph 29. And if we could have that on screen, please. That's page nine. And at paragraph 29, you say, regarding disclosure, my role involved disclosing information to solicitors representing suspects prior to an interview. As part of the prosecution process in England, I would be required to complete the documents of the type at. And you give two references. Those are disclosure schedules, aren't they? That's correct. Um, and other disclosure forms. <coughs> These forms are not required in Scotland. So this is the first additional difference that you refer to. What was required in Scotland if those schedules of disclosure were not? I can't recall if there were any. The second additional difference that you raise is at paragraph 139 of your statement. And if we can have that on screen, please. That's page 37. <coughs> you say at 139, another difference is that in England, we are only required to summarise the tape transcripts from, from an interview, while in Scotland, we are required to type out the full tape transcripts from an interview. So that's, the, that's another difference that you're highlighting in your statement. That's correct. And third, you re refer to evidential requirements. And this is at paragraph 137. So back one page, please. <coughs> Towards the bottom. And here you say the process also differed in that in Scotland, corroboration of evidence is required. You need to have two separate sources of evidence. For example, if a person transacts a deposit into their bank account using Horizon without putting the money in the drawer, the two sources of evidence could be drawn from the Horizon data, bank statements, CCTV, or witness evidence. On this last difference, how did the requirement for corroboration of evidence under Scots law affect the investigations that you carried out in Scotland? Sorry, could you repeat that, please? You've discussed at this paragraph the requirement for two sources of evidence, so corroborative evidence. How did this requirement in Scotland impact upon the investigations you carried out in Scotland? as opposed to those in England and Wales? If you could only draw evidence from, for instance, the horizon data, and there was no supporting evidence, then you couldn't proceed with a case. Whereas in England and Wales, horizon data alone would be sufficient, would it? I believe so. Turning, please, to the change in the process for investigations in Scotland to allow for the involvement of a Scottish firm of solicitors. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 21 <coughs> of the statement? That is page 7. And at paragraph 21, you say this. In my, in my performance review for 2013-2014 at uh, poll 00105145, I refer at pages three and four to some work I did to secure specialist legal advice for Scottish casework when Scottish cases were submitted to poll legal services for review. It wasn't recognised within poll legal services and the it was recognised within poll legal services and the security team that they weren't knowledgeable about Scots law. I was concerned that I wasn't receiving the same legal support, and I recall that I asked if Scottish solicitors could be sought to assist and advise on whether there was sufficient evidence to submit a file 
to COPFS. I was advised to identify a suitable firm, and after researching some candidates, I identified BTO LLP solicitors. I believed they would be best suited as they employed a number of former procurator fis procurator fis procurators fiscal and had an office in Glasgow. I recall that I informed John L. Singh in Poll Legal Services, and I believe he contacted them and made arrangements for them to advise me on Scottish cases. When you say that it was recognised by post office legal services that they weren't knowledgeable about Scots law, do you mean that there were no Scottish, Scottish qualified lawyers within the criminal law team? Correct. Is it right, therefore, that prior to managing to gain approval for BTO solicitors to advise on Scottish cases in, would it have been 2013? From that, that document, I believe it was. The criminal law team was providing a decision on whether a case should be passed to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service without being qualified in Scottish law. I believe so, yes. Did that concern you at the time? It did concern me more when I was on my own in Scotland from about 2000, end of 2008, 2009 possibly. Uh, I was only investigator and I just felt as if at times I would pass a case down to the criminal law team and there wasn't a full understanding of Scots law. I did approach the subject prior to 2013, requesting if we can get anyone. It just wasn't forthcoming at that time. I can't recall the dates when I, I did that. Can you recall how long before 2013 you raised that? Possibly a couple of years. I just I, I can't be certain. Can you recall who you raised it with? It would be my line management first and foremost. And who in particular was that? It would, whoever was my line manager at that time, it may have been Andrew Daly, it may have been after him. <coughs> and when you did raise it, what was the response? I can't recall what the response was, but uh, we just didn't get uh, a Scottish lawyers on board. Did BTO's involvement have any impact upon the volume of recommendations to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to prosecute? As in, did it increase the number we yeah. sent for? Either way, whether it Are increased we, or decreased. It gave a more informed uh, decision on whether it should go forward or not. Do you consider that post office investigators in Scotland were not adequately supported prior to the appointment of BTO solicitors to advise in 2013? Yes. <clears throat> Turning please to your relationship with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Did you have a particular point of contact at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service? No. Were you ever asked, following submission of a case to the COPFS, to conduct further inquiries? Yes. What kind of further inquiries would you be asked to conduct? There is some documents uh, that I, I was provided with that would be able to detail that. I can't think at this moment in time, it may be, latterly it was in regards to Horizon. Mm -hmm. uh, it, one of the main things they asked was when, when was the money first taken or when was it stolen and you had to provide an answer with that, any information you could give. So setting aside 
what happened after the second site report and just looking yeah. back previously to that. Um, you've given those examples of dates on which money um, <coughs> went missing. Um, are there any examples that you have for that earlier period about pinpointing dates other than those? Sorry, could you repeat the question? You've given the example of being asked about the sp specific date on which money went missing. Were there are any other type of inquiries prior to second sites review from the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service? And what type of inquiries were you asked to conduct? I'm trying to recall specifically because I can't, there's none that come to mind at this moment in time. Um, They may request a, a further statement from someone, from a witness. Uh, that could be an example. Um, in regards to a product, I, I can't think of anything at this moment in time. Did they ever ask you to obtain audit data from Fujitsu <coughs> prior to the point of second sites review? I can't recall if they did or not. Before the second site report, were you ever asked about the reliability of the Horizon system data in any cases you had submitted to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service? I can't recall. Did you observe any differences in how the criminal law team approached prosecutions? when compared with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service? Sorry, could I clarify? Well, for example, in terms of the decision to prosecute, did you observe any differences in approach between the criminal law team in cases in England and Wales yeah. and the approach of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service in Scotland? Sorry, my mind's going blank here. Um, I don't think there was any differences in approach <clears throat> that I can think of. If evidence, any further evidence was required, then they approached ourselves in regards to that. Did you observe any difference in terms of consideration of public interest factors? Not that I'm aware of. Did you observe any differences in terms of lines of inquiry to be pursued? I would say the procurator fiscal was probably more, di more direct because it didn't have an understanding of the workings of the post office. Did you observe any differences in terms of approach to disclosure over and above the technical differences or in disclosure obligations? Not that I'm aware of. You say at paragraph 14 of your first statement <coughs> that each year all managers within the post office have to complete a six month and annual and performance an annual performance and development review. You've been referred to your performance and development development review for 2013 <coughs> to 2014 by the inquiry and you've commented on that in your statement. <coughs> More recently, the inquiry has provided you with copies of one-to-one -one meetings with your line manager, Andrew Daly, from 2009. Have you had a chance to look through those 2009 and 2010 documents? I did. <clears throat> I'd like to look first to, to those one-to-one -one line manager meetings with Andrew Daly. Could we have on screen, please, POL 00333405? This is the 
This document relates to a meeting on the 9th of November 2009, covering the period of the last three months. <coughs> Under update priorities met, it says that the following requirements or action points have been met. <coughs> and under one, taken over Raymond's X cases and have registered these via the SRA system, progressing towards PF, is that procurator fiscal? It is, yes. Prosecution. In the box below, there are some comments from Mr. Daly, which read as follows. Following my meeting with Robert, I found that he is a motivated member of the security team he has taken over some difficult cases from Raymond. One case is fairly intricate and has taken to bring and has taken to bring to fruition. None of Raymond's cases were reported to the PF, so Robert is under pressure to register them with the PF brackets online and progress them to the point of prosecution. He is doing very well processing the stagnant cases and the fruits of his labour will show in the new year although PF cases take ages to prosecute once it's handed over to the PF. Robert also has good ideas and is very motivated. Robert took the opportunity to liaise with the PF and established whether the PO fraud strand can assist them with a different type of report, etc. He is awaiting a date to meet with the PF. It is also clear that he has a good working relationship with his local CM, Brian Trotter. Pausing there, who was Brian Trotter? He was a contracts manager. Scotland, along with Robert Finlay. Mr Daly goes on, Robert has at least double the amount of cases due to the volume of cases raised in Scotland and the size of Scotland. Robert is the only investigator in Scotland. This has placed him under some pressure, but he is coping well. Robert has such a good, has such a good relationship with the CMs and other post office staff. These cases find their way to him once detected. I will get the rest of the team to also take on more workload in the Scottish region so that Robert is not overloaded. You have referred in your second statement to you and Raymond Grant being the only investigators in Scotland in 2008. Is that yes. right? Yes. It appears that, that, that by this point in November 2009, you were the only investigator in Scotland. Is that right? Yes. Why had none of Mr Grant's cases been reported to the Procurator Fiscal? Can you recall? I have no idea. Did you review these cases before passing them to the Procurator Fiscal's office? I can't recall what stage of the investigation those cases were at. They may have been ready just to uh, be reported. They may not have. I can't recall. And this point in time in November 2009 was before you had had the benefit of any advice from Scottish solicitors, mm. is that right? That's correct. Did you feel under pressure to refer these cases to the Procurator Fiscal, given the apparent backlog and the fact that you were the only investigator in Scotland? Um. I'm not sure how I felt at the time, to be honest with you. Yeah. I know, and I can't recall all the cases that were there or how many it was. I couldn't really say how I felt at the time. Did you feel that the investigations team in Scotland was understaffed? Yes. Did this have an impact on the quality of your investigations? I don't, don't think so, no. The next box at the bottom deals with progress against personal objectives, and the first column sets out the relevant objective. If we can go <coughs> over the page, please. <coughs> and going over one more page, please the top there, we can see an objective. Recovery of 40% of monies from investigations conducted 
to have a positive return rate against investigation element of team. And in the next column, which deals with progress since last meeting, it says, exceeding target, CXL data attached. Is this a reference to recovery of monies from those who were prosecuted, whether by way of confiscation proceedings or civil recovery? It may not just have been for prosecutions. It may have been those that weren't prosecuted. Is it right that as an investigator, you were set a target for recovery of monies from those who were investigated? Yes. Was your performance measured in part against your target? Not as a whole. Um, when you investigate someone, you would ask if they, they were in a position to repay the money. Not everyone knows, was. So it, it would have been part of the personal development review, but not as a whole. If you had not met your target of recovery of 40% of monies from investigations conducted, would you have been marked down? Not necessarily. Uh, it all depends on how you performed in the other parts of your objectives. It appears from this document that you exceeded your target for this period. How was that rewarded, if at all, by the post office? It wasn't. It was just part of my, my targets. Going over the page, please. We can see the next box is review of behaviours action. And going over the page again, please. There seem to be some examples. Are these examples given by you? Yes, they are. And the third example says this. Earlston PO took on case from colleague, advised Procurator Fiscal on analysis of Horizon information. Unfortunately, she deemed insufficient evidence for theft. Discussed a charge of uttering. Can you help with what uttering is? <coughs> I couldn't tell you the legal term, but uttering is basically to produce something you know to be false. Um, as Postmaster has had repaid £3,000, this was considered and accepted. Awaiting outcome of plea from defence. Yeah. You were here providing an example of you analysing horizon information. Can you help with what analysis you would have been doing? I, I can't recall that. It may have been uh, information that was already in the case file when I took it over. I don't recall doing any further work on that case file. I believe it was already with the Procurator Fiscal. And it may have been uh, assistance the Procurator Fiscal was requesting and regarding the horizon information uh, disclosed. Where you were doing analysis of horizon information, were you analysing printouts from the branch, from the horizon system, or audit data obtained from Fujitsu, or both? I don't recall. I couldn't honestly tell you. You appear here to have been dissatisfied with the Procurator Fiscal's decision that there was insuffic insufficient evidence of theft based on the Horizon data. Was this an issue that came up frequently in Scotland, that Horizon data alone would be deemed insufficient to prove theft? I'm not too sure if that was just due to the Horizon information. That may not have been that. It may have been other evidence as well. I honestly could not say if that was just down to Horizon information. I don't recall. 
I'm not trying to be too legalistic about this, but <clears throat> Horizon Information alone would not be sufficient, would it, if there's a requirement for corroboration? That's correct. If, if they were relying on Horizon and another piece of evidence, whatever that evidence was, and they felt the other piece was sufficient, but the Horizon wasn't, then they would consider that to be insufficient evidence because it does, one, does, wouldn't, one doesn't help the other if you... If no, there had to be two independent pieces of evidence, yeah? Yes. <clears throat> Mr Daly, being aware of the need for corroborative evidence of Horizon data, were there still cases being put forward to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service relying solely on Horizon data? You say solely, as in the only As evidence. in there was not corroborative evidence, there wasn't a second source. It would appear, the reason I ask, Mr Daly, is it would appear on one reading of this that there was analysis of Horizon information that was put forward to the Procurator Fiscal's Office and it was deemed insufficient evidence for theft. So my question is, notwithstanding the need for two sources, yes. were cases still being put forward with one source, Horizon data? No, they wouldn't have been put forward with one source. You'd have put more than one production in, in regards to the, whether it was a theft or embezzlement. You would provide the productions to the Procurator Fiscal. The pr Procurator Fiscal, as with exhibits, would look at those productions, and if it was two of those independent sources were sufficient to proceed to a prosecution, he would take them forward. If there wasn't, then it, the case would be dropped. You wouldn't just be putting forward the Horizon data itself in any case. Could we have on screen, please, POL 0033406? This is another one-to-one -one meeting record of a meeting between you and Mr. Daly, Andrew Daly. It relates to a meeting on the 4th of February 2010 by telephone relating to the previous three months. And Mr. Daly's comments are recorded in box three and read as follows. Robert remains one of the top investigators in the fraud strand. His keen attitude and commitment is exemplified in the prosecutions and especially the recovery of the loss, see spreadsheet. Robert is always willing to assist where he can, even if this means that he has to travel long distances or work long hours. He has a can-do attitude and looks at all the avenues in order to prosecute a case, but he is also mindful of the Scottish legal system and the various regional PF's <coughs> idiosyncrasies. Um, I am concerned that Robert is trying to do too much in Scotland and get bogged down. If a wave of Scottish cases arrive, brackets, new horizon roll out findings, these will need to be allocated to other investigators who must attend to them without Robert assisting, brackets, taking statements, etc. Otherwise, he will just get bogged down in their, with their work. The reference here to you looking at all avenues to prosecute a case... You say in your statement at your first statement at paragraph 64 that you played no role in relation to prosecution decision making. It might appear from that comment that you were actively trying to secure <coughs> pro prosecution decisions from the COP, from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Is that right? No, that's not correct at all. I can see how that looks but I'm not sure why uh, my line manager at the time, Andrew Daly, wrote it that way, because all I can do is take a case, look at all the evidence, and if there's sufficient evidence at that time to put it forward to the Procurator Fiscal, that's what I did. 
and it's the procreate of fiscal. You, ca you can't persuade a procreate of fiscal to prosecute. They make that decision independently. Can you help with why you needed to be mindful of the Scottish legal system <coughs> and the various regional procurator fiscal's idiosyncrasies? I'm not sure why you wrote that either. I, I, I don't understand what you was talking there, talking about. Does the reference to the new Horizon rollout here refer to the rollout of Horizon Online? I believe it would have been if that's when it was rolled out in 2010. Was it expected that there would be a wave of cases <coughs> following its rollout? <coughs> they were sending, uh, not just auditors, I, th I think it was trainers, and to do cash checks prior to Horizon Online going in. And from what I recall, <coughs> they thought there may be a lot, of, a lot of cash shortages identified when this was getting done. Could we have on screen, please, POL 001-05025? This document is the individualised objectives for security team members for 2013 to 2014. The objectives for you are set out on pages <coughs> 128 to 129. Could we go to page 128, please? We can see your name and the first two boxes on this page refer to core behaviours. Just scrolling down, please. Then over to the next page. The third objective is to ensure a robust approach to fraud loss recovery with a return rate of 65%. Activity to include, ensure that evidence opportunities are maximized through stakeholder engagement, technical elements of inquiries are effectively deployed, searches of persons premises, Ensuring full engagement with FIs, is that financial investigators? It does, yes. And police contacts optimising <coughs> POCA powers to achieve maximum possible recovery, e.g. Mon monetary recovery, asset recognition. Ensure all intervention measures are adopted to recover stolen funds. It appears here that the target for loss recovery has increased since the 2009 one-to-one -one meeting record we looked at. Then you were over target at 40%, and here the objective is 65%. Is that right that the target was increased by the post office? I believe that target was increased uh, after I was sent to document my objectives for 2000. I can't remember if it was 12 to 14 or 11 to 12, and it was the same figure of 65% on it. It was increased at some point, yes. Why was it increased? I can only think it was because of the amount of losses the post office was suffering. Uh, Was this target indicative of the recovery of funds from those being investigated being a high priority within the post office? Sorry, can you clarify what you mean there? This target and the fact that it had been increased. Yes. Is that indicative that the recovery of funds from those being investigated was a high priority within the post office?
it was never looked upon as that when we received our targets or objectives, but it was suggested it was. Was this a target set for all post office investigations? <laughs> yes. It was a target you were aware of because it was part of your performance objectives? Yes. Do you think this ever influenced the conduct of investigations you were charged with? No. Could we have on screen, please, POL 001-05145? This is a record of your one-to-one -one performance review with Helen Dickinson. Uh, for the year 2013 to 14. If we can go over the page, please. We see reviewee, you and review owner Helen Dickinson. Was the purpose of the performance review to review performance against the objectives which had been set? Yes. Could we go please to page two of this document? Well, we're on page two in fact, so about halfway down the page. And you say about halfway down, my PDR is completed to time scale. Yes. <laughs> and then there's a hashtag 160. I have achieved an 86% recovery brackets, pounds, 68,733 in my cases. <laughs> so it appears from this that you had exceeded your 65% target, is that right? That's correct. To repeat a question I asked before, <clears throat> how was meeting this objective at this stage rewarded by the post office? I understand where this is coming from, uh, where we've been given bonuses for recovering money. It, it was part of our objectives to do so. It didn't necessarily rely on a bonus. We received a bonus every year, regardless. The bonuses that were received, for, for whatever reason, yep. Were those individual bonuses or team bonuses? <coughs> no, they were individual bonuses and in how you performed over a year, if you performed better than someone else. So technically you could say this went towards, but if you speak to individuals within the investigation team, the, invest the investigation managers, it was always considered uh, an unfair target because any any inquiry you did, any case you did, all you could say to the person were you in a position to repay the money. If that person didn't have the money, you couldn't get blood out of a stone. Could we go to page four of this document, please? About two thirds of the way down the page is a heading financial investigators. And under this heading, you say this, I have long recognized that a FI, financial investigator, is required for Scotland, as the Crown Office has now deemed that Police Scotland FI, and can you help with that, RS quos? Yes. Unfortunately, it was a system we put it into when you printed it out. It, as you can see, with 160 dash, plus hashtag. Is that Police Scotland pound. FIs? It's FI and it's, a, it's, it's Police Scotland Financial Investigation Investigators, and it was and there was another name I can't recall what the name was, but it was just Police Scotland Financial Investigators. 
So the Crown Office has now deemed that Police Scotland FIs are no longer to be used as a debt collecting agency for external business. I have set up and attended an initial meeting with Police Scotland and Post Office Limited FI, and then we have the same uh, set of symbols. The meeting discussed how Poll can access recovery from POCA through a complicated legal system. I am currently engaging with the Scottish Business Resilience Centre to ascertain if there are any agreed protocols concerning other government bodies ut utilising POCA powers. This is an issue that has never been progressed like the rest of the UK, and I am determined to progress this as far as possible to ensure Poll Scotland <coughs> have the same recovery procedures and support as in the rest of the UK. This continues to be a work in progress, and SBRC are making inquiries to assist Poll. I have discussed with BTO solicitors regarding a ru running a civil case alongside the criminal case to ensure Poll are at the forefront of creditors. A draft is being worked on by BTO to be put to Poll for consideration. I am taking all steps to ensure Poll can recover funds from sub postmasters. <coughs> When you say the Crown Office had deemed that Police Scotland financial investigators were no longer to be used as a debt collecting agency for external business, does this mean that this is how <coughs> Police Scotland financial investigators had been viewed, at least by the Post Office, prior to this? I don't believe that's how they were viewed by the Post Office. And I don't think that was in regards to the post office, that statement coming out. How did the Crown Office convey this stance to the post office? I can't recall how it was conveyed. What did you propose, insofar as you can recall, in relation to the use of POCA when you met with Police Scotland? <laughs> I think it was to ask them about their powers in the recovery of access, uh, uh, recovery of <coughs> assets, or basically cash. Uh, and I'm sure that in Scotland you need to, and I could be wrong, a section three in real, uh, and none of our financial investigators had a section three. I can't, I can't recall what was fully discussed, but I think it was along those lines. You appear to attach significant importance to this issue <coughs> in your performance review. <coughs> Is that fair? When you write your performance review, you... You're flowering things up to make it look good in fairness. And uh, when I say it was the main, main thing, the main issue for me, it wasn't as such. What I did recognise was in England and Wales, there was financial investigation making recoveries. Uh, <clears throat> and I took it with BTO solicitors and it was another avenue to look at in regard to a civil case and how we can recover any losses to the post office. Was this issue something you understood to be of significant importance for senior managers within the security team? Yes. If they were going to put a 65% recovery on it, then they had to view Scotland the same as everyone else. You refer in your first statement to a financial evaluation form. <laughs> yes. Could we have paragraph 18 of Mr. Daly's first statement on screen, please? It is page six of the statement. <coughs> At paragraph 18, you say this. In my CV, I mentioned the financial evaluation form 
Following an interview with a suspect, I was required to complete a financial evaluation sheet. This detailed the suspect's name, the post office branch, and what they had said about the loss. The form also recorded my opinion on the loss and any financial details given by the suspect, including how they intended to repay any monies. Although I had to complete the form for Scottish cases, it was recognised that poll financial investigators did not have the authority to conduct a financial investigation in Scotland. Was this form part of the strategy for recovery of monies from those being investigated? Yes, it was. Was the purpose of this form to assess the chances of recovery of monies? Yes. So this form, just to be clear, was not a way of trying to follow the money, so to speak, to establish whether, for example, theft had occurred? No, the form itself was, sorry, the form itself was to, uh, to try and obtain information on what assets a suspect had, and it was passed to the financial investigators to then follow that through. Just one more document on this topic, please. Could we have on screen, please, POL 0005678? This is an email from Zoe Topsham to you, dated the 3rd of March, 2012. Well, apologies. That maybe the wrong way around, looking at the email below. I think that may be the 3rd of May. Scrolling up, please. 3rd of May, to, um, 2012. It forwards a link originally sent by Alison Bolsover to you, which appears, scrolling down, please, Which appears to be a news article relating to the Seema Misra case, and it's www.getsurrey.co.uk forward slash news. And the indication as to the title of the piece is Postmistress Who Stole 75,000 to Pay Back Just One. And then going back up, please, to Ms. Topsham's email to you. She says, one of my other cases, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, something to cheer you up, double exclamation mark. What discussions had you had with Ms. Topsham about this case, about the Seema Misra case, if any? I have no idea because it wasn't my case. Uh, I can only <coughs> think that we had to inform the former agent state team if we'd got a recovery from what I recall, and if I had f informed her that on a case that we hadn't got a recovery, she may have just sent this to me because uh, she wasn't getting any, they weren't getting any recovery from that one as well. Why Zoe sent it to me, I, I can't recall why she sent it, but the Misra case was not one of my cases. Okay. Can you offer any insight into why she thought this was something that might cheer you up? I think that was a sarcastic comment. That document can come down now, thank you. <laughs> Moving please to ARQ data requests. <coughs> you say at, uh, in your first statement at paragraph 19, that cases had to be submitted within appropriate timescales and that you believe this may have been 12 days from the interview of a suspect. Is that right? Yes. Was that the case for both England and Wales and Scotland? Yes. So by 12 days post-interview, <coughs> you were expected to have filed your investigation report with the criminal law team. Is that right? You had to at least provide an interim report, if I recall, because you may not have conducted all your inquiries. 
Is it fair to say you had limited time to conduct inquiries before you submitted at least an interim report? Yes. Did you ever request ARQ data from Fujitsu in an investigation before you submitted your interim or final investigation report to the criminal law team, i.e. within that 12-day frame or time frame? <laughs> I may have. Uh, there may have been occasions when I didn't, and that was recorded in the interim report that had been requested. Uh, you had to. You would not have got the ARQ data back within 12 days, from what I recall. So, it would, if there was any mention, it would be that you'd requested it. In terms of the circumstances in which ARQ data was sought from Fujitsu. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 89 of Mr. Daly's first statement? It is page 24. At paragraph 89, you say this. Paragraph 29 of the request asks ARQ data requested from Fujitsu as a matter of course when a shortfall had been identified and the relevant SPM, SPM's manager assistants, Crown Office employee, attributed the shortfall to problems with Horizon. And in response to that question, you say ARQ data was not requested from Fujitsu as a matter of course. It would only have been requested if it was relevant to an inquiry. In what circumstances would ARQ data have been considered relevant to an inquiry? It may have been in relation to what we call gyro suppression, suppression of someone's bank accounts. Uh, If it was suspected they were paying money into a bank account, or it could be a card account inquiry, uh, where I tend to find it was elderly people, uh, a member of family had noted that there was money being taken from their account, and the person had uh, approached the counter and was told the pin wasn't working and to put the, the pin in again, and the postmaster was suspected of stealing the second amount. So you'd be looking for ARQ data to see and request the card details for that, that person's account. And that would tell you when, how many transactions were done out of that card account at a time. Did you ever request ARQ data with the purpose of investigating a suggestion by a sub-postmaster, uh, assistant or manager, or an employee of the post office, that the horizon system was the cause of an apparent <coughs> shortfall? In relation to it just being, that being a problem, I don't recall it just being in regards to that because if there was a if they suggested it was a problem with Horizon, then it would be put into the report to be submitted up to the line manager and forwarded on. And I would expect that to be followed through by them with Fujitsu. The ARQ data would be I can only think in relation to a product we may believe that money was paid into, or as I stated previously. If, sorry, I should add to that. If someone had said it was Horizon data, we would have requested a statement from Fujitsu. So the impression I'm getting, um, and correct it if I'm wrong, Mr. Daly, <coughs> is um, you you acting alone, so to speak, would request ARQ data where you thought it might support the prosecution case. Yes, sir. 
if the suggestion was that it might undermine it, you'd send it up the line. Is that it? You would include it in the report, but you would, uh, I would likely request a statement from uh, Fujitsu right. in, reg in regards to whether there was issues at that branch. Mm -hmm. That that would that would go with the that be requested through, along with the RQ data at the time, sir. Could we go over the page, please, to paragraph ninety-two? <coughs> In this paragraph, you are uh, addressing an email in which you requested audit data from Fujitsu. And you say in this paragraph that you would only contact Fujitsu if it was specifically required for a case. Do you mean by this that you would only contact Fujitsu if you were asked <coughs> to by someone else? I recall, if I remember uh, correctly, after viewing the documents, I had received a statement from Andy Dunks from Fujitsu. I needed a signed copy of that statement, and I went direct to him only because I'd been copied in on an email uh, with his details on it, and that was in relation just to getting a, a statement signed. I believe that's what that was. Otherwise, any any. Any requests for a Fujitsu, including statements, went through our post office security team or the casework team, as it was. I'd like to turn, please, to the investigation <coughs> and prosecution of Peter Holmes. <laughs> You deal with this case at paragraphs 97 to 132 of your statement. It's right, isn't it, that you interviewed Mr. Holmes following the identification of an apparent shortfall by an audit conducted in September 2008 at the post office branch, which you managed? Yes. You also completed an investigation report, in fact, two investigation reports, an interim one and a final one. Yes. Which were submitted to the criminal law team. And you completed a schedule of non-sensitive, unused material in the case, saying in your first statement to the inquiry that you were the disclosure officer in the case. Is that right? That's correct. Starting, please, with the interview of Mr. Holmes on the 19th of September 2008. Could we have the report of tape recorded interview on screen, please? It is POL 00050208. We can see on the face of this that the interview was on the 19th of September. The duration of the interview was 45 minutes. You were listed as the interviewing officer, and Christopher Knight was the second interviewing officer. Is that right? That's correct. Going to page two, please. About halfway down the page, you asked about Mr. Holmes's experience with Horizon, and you say, and your experience with Horizon, how would you rate it? <coughs> and Mr. Holmes's response was, very slow, it's okay, it's an auditor's tool. That particular one we had problems uh, with because it was connected to a telephone line that also had the fax machine connected to it. And you ask, what one's that Jesmond? Answer, Jesmond, and we had BT engineers 
in looking at the line. We had horizon engineers in looking at the line. And eventually, we had to take the fax machine out, throw it away, and get a new one in provided by Mr. Kanna. And now uh, Mr. Kanna was the sub-postmaster, is that right? Yes. And now it seemed to work. But there was a time there when it wasn't so slow, it wasn't so good. People using cards just weren't getting through. You ask, what period was that? The answer, I suppose, nine months ago for three months. So we're talking about the beginning of this year, December. Yeah, I'm not very good with times, but yes, possibly. And then PH states that they had engineers coming on over a three-month period. Over the page, please, towards the bottom, at 14.50... We then have a summary. PH explains the computer program is really slow at the end of the day, taking up to one and a half hours. He continued that Doreen leaves at about 6.30 p.m. with him staying until 7.30 p.m. And later in the interview, you ask Mr. Holmes about the apparent shortage found on audit of just over 46,000 pounds. It's page eight of this document, please. Starting at 26.04. And you ask, right, okay, well, the situation here then, Peter, that the audit have come in on the 18th of September, 2008. Can you tell me what happened that morning? And Mr. Holmes says, yes, and they'll let me in, give me the keys. The auditors introduced themselves. I looked at their passes, went into the post office and let them have a go at it. And they found that there was two cash declarations made and one was well out. And at the end of the audit, 46,000 odd was missing. And you give the exact figure there. And he says, yeah. So what can you tell me about the shortage then? I've absolutely no idea. No idea. Absolutely no idea, unless it's the horizon that's let us down. I mean, there's no one in there stolen 46,000. I haven't got it. It's not in my bank account. I spent too many years in the police force seeing things go wrong to start stealing money from anybody. I just, I really do not know. And then you ask, why, are there, why is there two cash declarations then? Uh, there was one in because I knew that we were showing short and I covered it up. Covered what up? The fact that we were short in cash. <coughs> How much by? Not that much. I can't remember the exact figure. Roughly, it started off as four or 5,000. When was that? Oh, six or nine months ago. When you said it started off four or 5,000, what did it creep up to? Well, it's now up to 40, it's up to 46,000 now. So, so Mr. Holmes was clear in saying that there had been problems with the horizon system in the branch, necessitating the attendance of an engineer, hadn't he? The first part of the interview that we'd looked at. Yes. And he was suggesting here that the apparent shortfall might have been caused by the horizon system, wasn't he? Yes. You deal with this at paragraph 18, uh, apologies, 98 of your first statement. Could we have that on screen, please? It's page 27 of the first statement. <coughs> and at paragraph 98, you say this. Paragraph 38 of the request asks me if I was aware of any allegations made by Peter Holmes relating to the reliability of the Horizon IT system, and if so, what I thought the significance of this was. Mr. Holmes indicated during interview that the loss may be down to the Horizon system. At the time, I don't believe I would have been aware of the significance of this, as I don't recall being aware of any issues with Horizon at the time. Mr. Holmes said he couldn't explain the losses, and I didn't believe anyone else in the office had stolen the money. In terms of what you did to investigate the issues being raised by Mr. Holmes, 
we are assisted to some extent by an interim investigation report you completed on, in October 2008. Could we have that on screen, please? It's POL 0005033340. And if we could go to the second page of this document, please. It is only two pages, just scrolling down to the bottom. We can see the date there, the 6th of October, 2008. And about halfway in the middle of this page, you deal with Mr. Holmes's account given an interview. And can we scroll up a little, please? And you say, Mr. Holmes denied theft of the money however admitted false accounting over a period of no less than nine months. Horizon data has been requested to ascertain when Mr. Holmes started producing false cash declaration and subsequently false accounts. Mr. Holmes made allegations that Horizon equipment was faulty over a period of time in early 2008. A request has been made to ascertain if this was the case. These papers are submitted for the current position to be noted. So this was an interim investigation report, was it? Yes. Focusing on first on the request, you say it was made to ascertain whether the horizon equipment was faulty. You revisit this in your final investigation report. Could we have that on screen, please? It's POL 000-508-508-32. Going to page eight of this document, please, which is the last page. We can see that it is dated the 30th of January, 2009. Going back to page three, please. And the last paragraph on this page. Scrolling down, please. Scrolling right the way down, please. Questions were put to Mr. Holmes regarding the figure of the loss there, shortage discovered at audit. Mr. Holmes said the auditors found that there were two cash declarations made and that one was around £46,000 out. Mr. Holmes stated he had no idea what happened to the money, adding it may have been the Horizon system. He further stated nobody in the office had stolen the £46,000. He then said he didn't have it. It wasn't in his bank account. He further said he had spent too many years in the police force seeing things go wrong to start stealing money from anyone. So you put into your investigation report, didn't you, the, the issues that were being raised by Mr Holmes in relation to the system? Yes. And going, please, to page seven of this document. <coughs> the second line down, you say this. Mr. Holmes also made allegations the Horizon equipment was faulty over a period of time in early 2008. <coughs> this has been checked and the allegations are unfounded. And going further down the page, please about two thirds of the way down. Mr. Holmes has attempted to blame the Horizon system on the shortages. However, checks have revealed no problems. In relation to the checks that you refer to here, <coughs> you address this at paragraph 104 of your first statement. Can we have that on screen, please? It's page 28. At paragraph 104, you say this. Paragraph 44 of the request asks me to consider my investigation reports. In particular, my report 
uh, that is the interim report, refers to a request being made to ascertain whether Horizon <coughs> equipment at the Jesmon branch was faulty. I note that at your final report, at page seven, my report says that checks had revealed no problems with Horizon. I cannot recall what checks were carried out in relation to Horizon at the branch, who carried out the checks, or what the results were. I've considered all the documents and can't find anything in relation to the request or the results of the checks. As you note in your statement here, there is no record that the inquiry has been able to find of to evidence any request for checks to be carried out, what checks, what any checks consisted of, or what the result of any of those checks were. No material was disclosed in the course of the prosecution of Mr. Holmes to show what checks were undertaken or how they were said to refute Mr. Holmes's concerns about the Horizon equipment. You completed the schedule of non-sensitive, unused material in Mr. Holmes' case. Could we have that on screen, please? It is POL 0005527. And scrolling down to the bottom, please, we can see the date of this. The 19th of May, 2009, as well as your name. If we can scroll up a little so that we can see the list of material here. Casting your eye down the list of material contained in this schedule, is there anything listed which you consider relates to the checks carried out to ascertain whether the Horizon equipment was faulty? No. Any such material would have been disclosable in these proceedings, wouldn't it? Yes. Would you accept the absence of such material being listed here <laughs> reflects either a failure in the investigation, i.e. a failure <coughs> to properly investigate the issues being raised by Mr. Holmes and have those checks carried out. No, or, a, a, sorry. Or a failure in disclosure on your part. No, I can't say, uh, I can't say it, it does. Uh, as I stated in my se second statement, there would have been a list of exhibits and Without that list of exhibits, I can't say for definite what was disclosed to the criminal law team. I would not have put those comments into my uh, the final report if I hadn't conducted them, conducted them. I don't understand why there's no paperwork there in relation to them. I have asked for the green file jacket, uh, which came all the, the paperwork, and I've not been able to obtain that. That would at least give me some indication of how, of what was requested and what the result of those checks were. So that that marks a break in um, subtopics under the uh, case of Mr. Holmes. I wonder if it uh, might be convenient to take an early lunch at that point until 10 to 2. Yes, of course. So we'll break off for lunch until 10 to 2. Thank you, sir.